Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Amen. Thank you so much for praying with us. Before I continue, is there anybody who has a specific word on your heart? You just felt the Holy Spirit speak something to you while we were worshiping this morning that you want to share with the rest of us? Anybody who has a word or a picture? Is that Sia moving or Sia bringing a word? That's Sia moving. Okay. Fantastic. Our venue is coming along nicely. We've got the parking eventually. And for those who are visiting, we only moved in here a couple of weeks ago at the start of the year, and sort of we think we've been here for six or seven weeks, and every week there's a little bit more being added. And, you know, I just, as we've been praying over these last couple of weeks, I just have a sense that we're, we're almost ready to start inviting people. You know, when you move into a house, you kind of just want to get, you know, at least the couch is set down and the cups packed out before you have your house warming. And I think we're moving close to that place. So I want to invite you to start inviting people, to start praying about who can I invite. Just create a culture, a habit of where we meet people. Let's just be friendly in inviting them. Say, hey, don't you want to come with me on Sunday? We've got a lot to grow. There's still a lot of stuff just physically around here that's going to change. We need to obviously just prepare our nets and our small groups even better. That's part of what the small group training is about. But let's begin to step out in faith and to extend invitations to colleagues, to family members. We'll be giving you some resources to help with that also in the next couple of weeks. It's something on WhatsApp or on your social media that you can use to invite people to come and join us. As I said, sort of in the welcoming, we're in the middle of a month of fasting, heading towards the end. For those who've been fasting with us so far, well done. We've only got one week left. The best is yet to come, so keep pressing through. I find myself in this week, really, just one moment, I was just really longing for the stuff I'm fasting. I was like, God, it would be really so amazing. And then I was like, but God, I love you more, and I love your purposes and your plans more. So let's just press on. We've got one week to go to press into the Lord. And this coming weekend, I want to encourage you to join us as much as possible. Not expecting everyone to be at all of the events we'll be meeting with, we'll, we'll post on social media as well. I think Brahm is, um, and on our WhatsApp updates group. So if you're not on one of those, please do either join our Instagram, our Facebook, or there's some QR codes outside that you can take a picture with with your WhatsApp. It'll add you to an updates group where we can keep you updated with what's going on. Brahm has become involved with a group here in the Brooklyn area who are praying for Brooklyn and We want to take perhaps as part of our fasting weekend a prayer walk through some of the streets of Hatfield and Brooklyn, and those details we'll be able to give you um, through the updates group and perhaps on our Instagram or Facebook. So if you can join that, that will help. But as we've been fasting, we haven't only been talking, we haven't only been fasting, we've been talking about fasting, studying about fasting a little bit, and we're carrying on around that theme this morning, and for those who haven't completely been with us. In the previous weeks, we looked a little bit at the fact that fasting should probably, and for a large part of Christian history, was a normal practice among Christians. We saw that, as Epiphanius said, most of us are probably, we don't know, but Epiphanius, Epiphanius asks, who does not know, with the implication that everybody in their time knew, except I did not know that the fast of the fourth and the sixth days of the week are observed by Christians throughout the world. And he was sort of one of the Middle Ages church fathers in the fifth century, the sort of, we saw in the early church, we saw later on in the Reformation, fasting was considered normal part of Christian life. And perhaps for us, as we grew up in Christian communities, Christian cultures, for some of us, perhaps it may have been, But for many of us, fasting is still a little bit of a a foreign concept. And we considered fasting as a sort of a a discipline that's part of the normal Christian life. As is prayer, as is fellowship, as is generosity or worship, 
servitude, fasting should be part of what we do as Christians. We looked at the passages in Matthew 6, around verse 17, where Jesus says, and when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. When you give, not if you give, when you give. In the same way, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast. And then he carries on to speak about the reward that comes from fasting, when we're fasting before the Lord. We looked at Matthew 9, where Jesus speaks about the bridegroom who has come. And what happens here is some of the disciples of John and some of the Pharisees and other people, they come to Jesus and say, why don't your people fast but our people do? And Jesus says, when you're at the wedding feast, when the bridegroom is there, you're not fasting. But there's going to be a time when the bridegroom is not there, and then they will fast. And so as the bridegroom left, he is no longer with us. We are fasting, but we are fasting different to with the way we did in the Old Testament. And Jesus carries on in that context to say, and when they fast, their fasting will be different. And he speaks about a new wineskin for new wine. And if you missed any of these sessions, they are all available on our podcast, on our YouTube channel, and you can catch up to them. We saw that the New Testament fasting is a little bit different to Old Testament because in the New Testament, our fasting is a fast of victory. It's a fast of overcoming, of freedom. It's a fast of a celebration for a bridegroom who has already come. It's an expectation, a hunger, a longing for more of what we have tasted from a little bit. And so we said three things that as we fast through this month that we're trusting God for, that each one of us individually, we would be hungry for His presence in our lives, in our family, just in our day-to-day, everything we do. God, we want to be hungry for You. Corporately, when we come together in our small groups, God, we are hungry for Your presence to be in our midst. We want to be hungry for His leading for His guidance, for His direction, the decisions we need to make about our families and about our careers, the decisions we need to make about our children and about finances, about our studies. God, we want to be led by You. God, we want to be on Your page. The decisions that we need to make as church leadership about the focus and the direction of what we're going to be doing. God, we want to be led by You. In a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be doing a sort of a let's go missions planning type of service for the year. And one, th- one of the things we want to add to our missions for this year, obviously we're rebooting a whole bunch of stuff that was shut down as a result of COVID, but life is opening up again. Borders are beginning to open up. So perhaps even now, I want to encourage you to start praying, God, which nation can I visit this year as an ambassador for Christ? God, where can I go to carry the gospel? We want to be sending teams to a variety of nations. But one of the things we're looking at is to add just a more regular, almost a monthly rhythmic flow, an outflow, a place where we can serve. And even in this week, Yaku and I went through to an orphanage area. Gareth, many of us know him, he's working there as well. And just asked, how can we serve? How can we be part of what they are doing serving there? And there are just so many opportunities to add value in that orphanage and the community center that they have there as well. So keep an eye open for that. Pray with us for God's leading around those type of decisions. We need to be led for His purpose. Who does God want us to be? How do we reach the people that God wants us to reach as a church and obviously individual? And then, God, we want to be hungry for Your power, Lord. Jesus, You promised, You said that those who believe in my name, they will go and they will cast out demons. They will heal the sick. They will set captives free. They will bring salvation and clarity to people's minds and to their thoughts. And God, we want to be in that flow, God. We want to represent you well. And so we've been praying for that as well. God, would you restore your power to our lives, to our prayer, Lord Jesus. When I walk up to my colleague who is struggling with cancer, God, I want to see you healing him. God, I want to see you working and speaking. God, we want, God, we're hungry. We were desperate for a move of your power in our midst. And then we spent some time, this is all just a little recap still. We spent some time talking about the importance of worship as part of our prayer and fasting. In Acts chapter 13, we saw that the church came together and they were worshiping 
and fasting. And then God spoke to them, and then they fasted and prayed some more, and then they made their decisions. We saw that fasting awakens our spirit. We saw from Daniel chapter 10 that his fast set in motion a whole sequence of events in the heavenlies. That when Daniel started fasting and praying, stuff happened in the spirit. We saw from that text that fasting leads us to surrender, to a yielding to God. It brings comfort and encouragement. Fasting is an expression of our humility that we can't, but God can. And fasting engages the spirit. Fasting allows us to engage in a dimension that we probably don't normally think of in the morning when we're walking or driving to work. I wonder how many of us in the morning when we wake up and we step into our daily sort of office routine or thinking of the spiritual dynamics that are at play in our workplace here, around the lives of when we drop our kids off at school. God, God, what's happening in the spiritual realm around our kids that we're dropping off at school, around my decisions that are making? And we saw fasting allows us a window into seeing what's happening in the Spirit. So that's sort of the, the first couple of weeks we spoke around those texts. Today I'm wanting us to look at perhaps the most famous in Scripture, at least, of all fasts. The fast that Jesus himself did right at the start of his ministry. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 4 primarily. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. And so where we're picking up this story is Jesus, Son of God, he's been living on earth for about 30 years, and by all accounts, a largely normal life. We see at about 12 years old, we get a little bit of a glimpse. He had a hunger for his father's house. He understood the scriptures already. As a 12-year-old, he had all of these learned Pharisees, and he was astounding them with his insight into the Word. But apart from moments like that, he seems to have been a reasonably ordinary boy growing up to a beer man working together with his father, depending sort of exactly on the translation that you dig into either sort of a stonemason, a carpenter, a woodworker, but he's working with his hands, he's adding value. He's a normal Jewish boy within a Jewish community with his love for the word and love for the father's house that we see evidently. His mother has in her heart this incredible promise. She knows she was a virgin and she conceived. She knows this kid is special. There have been some people who through his life, specifically when he was a kid, God spoke to them, and they knew this wasn't a normal guy. But for 30 years, he's been living a, a relatively normal life. I always wondered, did he clean his room every day? How did he do at school? My kids asked me the other day as well. You know, how did Jesus do? They didn't have structured school as such. But I wonder kind of what those interactions were like. Did he get 100% on every test? You know, how does, how does all of that work? And so here is Jesus for about 30 years living a largely normal life. And then he goes to get baptized. There's a man by the name of John the Baptist, and he's baptizing a whole string of people. And he's saying, guys, the Messiah is coming. The promised one is coming. The one who's going to set us free is coming. I'm not him, but he is coming. So let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our lives. And his baptism was a sort of a picture, a representation of our preparation. And then Jesus came to the Jordan River to be baptized, and John saw him. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one. And as Jesus is baptized, he comes up out of the water. And as he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. It's what we would call today. He's baptized in water, but he's also baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the authors who tell us the story, who give us the account of what happened, say it looked almost like a dove. It was this physical, visible thing that came and descended upon Jesus, not too dissimilar to a dove who came from heaven and descended upon him. The father opens up his, sort of tears the, the sky open, puts his head through the clouds, and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And the whole crowd, everyone knows Jesus is not normal. We've baptized hundreds, if not thousands of people by now. And this is the first time we've seen these things happen. And so 
straight from that, from that moment, Jesus' ministry now is about to start. I wonder if kind of you were planning, if you were thinking, what would be ideally the very first thing that Jesus should do as his ministry starts? And I love this about Scripture. It is so different to what you and I probably would have planned. The Holy Spirit leads him, and the very first thing the Holy Spirit leads him to do is to fast. Before he does anything else, this is where we pick up the story. Jesus returns from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all of that time, and surprisingly, became very hungry. And so here we see Jesus right at the start of his ministry, stepping out, led by the Spirit, to two things, to a wilderness and to fasting. We're going to see some great parallels here with a different time of people in the wilderness, but something I want to put out there, it's amazing how when kind of we sort of get into this Christian thing, our language begins to speak, and we begin to use this Christian language, and we speak about these wilderness experiences. And it's amazing to me how when people speak about wilderness experiences, most times we completely miss what Scripture speaks about in terms of wilderness experiences. We see Jesus here, that a wilderness experience was a time of intimacy with God. He is intimate with the Spirit. It's not a time of isolation and separation from God. So often we say, I'm a wilderness time. What do we mean? I'm being far from God. Well, Jesus here was not far from the Spirit. In the wilderness, we think of Joshua. We're going to look at this example now. And Moses, when they were in the wilderness, they'd been in slavery as a nation for about 400 years. And they come out of Egypt. There was this whole story with 10 plagues and just a whole lot of heartache and pain. And eventually, Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, said, the people can go. And they go and God opened the Red Sea. And they were headed to this promised land that God had prepared for them. And they didn't quite listen And so they ended up spending, instead of about 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness. And in this wilderness, every day there was a pillar of cloud by day hovering over them and a pillar of fire by night. Every day God's presence was tangibly with them. Every time Moses went into the tabernacle, that cloud by day or the fire by night would descend over the tabernacle to say that God is there now meeting with Moses. You see, the wilderness experience was not a time where they were far or distant or unacquainted with God. On the contrary, God was intimately with them in their wilderness experience. God was close. And so we see Jesus coming into the wilderness for 40 days. One of the things when we realize this is Jesus fasted because he needed to. Jesus didn't fast just because it was a nice idea, it was a good idea. This is 40 days out of a three-year ministry. It's a significant period that Jesus fasted. Jesus took time out because he needed to. There was purpose to his fasting. There was a reason to his fasting. It was the very first thing that he did as he stepped out into ministry. And the chances are, if Jesus needed to fast, you and I probably needed to too. If Jesus needed to go through this affliction, this voluntary process, we'll look at now of saying for a period, I am not going to eat. I'm going to deliberately draw close to God. Most likely, you and I will benefit from that as well, from fasting from deliberately stepping away from things for a season. And so after this, he is hungry. And in verse 3, the devil appears to him and says to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. And so what we see here in a very short text is reference to a very long process. They're referring here to this time when the 
people of Israel had come out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. That's where this whole bread and wilderness, all of this took place. So let's jump there perhaps to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to read just two verses there as a reminder in, in a sense of, and this is what Jesus is quoting where he says, people do not live by bread alone. He is quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. And so remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years. And we're going to see so many parallels. Jesus is in the wilderness. The people of Israel were in the wilderness. Jesus was there for 40 days. They were there for 40 years, humbling you and testing you. Jesus was tested by the devil, and God came and he tested the people of Israel to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna. And so literally what happened is they came out of Egypt and they were in this desert on the way to Israel, on the way to what later would become Israel, the promised land. They're on their way there. And they realize they're hungry and they go to God and they say, God, we don't have food in this desert. God said, don't worry, I've got this. I've got this. Yes, you're in the desert. Yes, there's nothing growing around you. But the next morning when they woke up, the kids went out of the tent to play like the kids do. And, and they said, what? And they picked up and they, what? And they ran to mom and they said, what? What is this stuff? And so they looked at all of this stuff and the parents were like, what? And Moses said, eat it. And that's where we get the word manna from, which in Hebrew means what? So there was this stuff lying on the ground and God was, I've got this. And every day for 40 years, they would wake up and there would be bread on the floor, except on the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath, there would be twice as much and they could gather twice as much so that they didn't have to collect on the Sabbath. And so God provided for them bread every single day. God came miraculously to show them that he is with them. And so he humbled you by letting you go hungry and feeding you with manna, feeding you with what, literally? Feeding you with this bread every morning, which you picked up from the ground a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. And he did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so as Jesus responds, as, Moses, as Satan comes and he tests Jesus, he says, Jesus, you're in this desert for 40 years. Do it again. Oh, for 40 days. This manna thing, do it again. You've done miracles in the past. Do the miracle again, Jesus. It's not so hard. If you are really the Son of God, just do it. Just something that I want to just perhaps put an asterisk there. Fascinates me every time I read this account. The Bible clearly says Jesus was tempted. I've never smoked in my life. God has been good to me in that context. <laughs> I've messed up a whole bunch of other ways, but that's just something that never appealed to me. So if you were to walk up to me now and put a pack of cigarettes in front of me, there would be absolutely no temptation inside of me. Perhaps some of us who've struggled with something like an addiction or smoking or so, maybe a packet of cigarettes, for a moment you would think that could be nice. Perhaps I should. There's some form of temptation. And so something that amazes me every time I read this is in every one of these three tests, there is a temptation. There is something that even if just for a fleeting moment, Jesus would consider this. Now, the temptation here is pretty obvious. For 40 days, he hasn't eaten. His body is, well, that would be nice. For just a fleeting moment, he's actually considering the devil's offer. He's like, oh, but. It, there would be something nice to doing what the devil says. And what is the test? The test is, will you repeat? Will you do those miracles again? And so we see the 40 years in the desert, 40 days in the wilderness. God led them both into this wilderness. There's this testing for both of them. They were both hungry. Jesus was hungry. We saw that God let them hunger. So what is the meaning of all this. Why are these strong parallels? Well, it's Jesus is voluntarily identifying with the people of Israel. 
He's saying that there where they failed, I'm going to step in. There where they didn't listen to God, I'm going to step in. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Just, this is, in a sense, just zooming into of what Jesus did in his coming to earth. He came from heaven to step into every one of our situations. So that there where we fail, we didn't have to feel bad and beat ourselves up about it. I'm not saying we shouldn't repent and turn and grow. But where we understand grace and we can turn and we can say, Jesus, we want to invite you in. Jesus, you've got this. And so Jesus steps into the similar situation where the Jews had found themselves generations before. And he says, I have got this. I've got this. He voluntarily comes and he identifies. He stands as a representative of the people. And in a sense, in a way, he becomes one of those who went through the Red Sea and were meant to go into the promised land. Not one of the people who came out of Egypt ended up going into the promised land. Not one of the adults. Because they disobeyed God when he spoke to them. And so that's why for 40 years they were in this desert. God had to wait practically for every person who had been over the age of 20 years old. When he gave them an instruction, they refused to obey. He had to wait for everybody over 20 to pass away. And then a new generation could walk into the promise. And so here is Jesus stepping in and he's saying, I'm going to make right what we've made wrong in the past. So God was preparing to lead his people out of bondage of slavery of Egypt, figuratively speaking. He came that, to do that in your life and in my life. Every one of us, we are bound by slavery to the things of this world. And he comes and he steps out. He makes that way. And he leads us into the promised land that he has prepared. The promised land that he's prepared for you and for me is a land of forgiveness and of righteousness. It's a land of hope and of joy, a, a land of life, a land of peace. And perhaps even this morning, if you're here and you have never experienced stepping into that which God has prepared for you, in a moment when we're finished, we would love to pray with you. We would love to pray with you that Jesus can take that burden off of your shoulders. That His stepping down into this earth would be a reality for you as well, that He has made a way. Something else from this passage that I want us just to zoom into for a moment. It says there in the middle, God humbled them and tested them to prove their character. I found this really beautiful quote from Richard Foster who wrote on, on fasting. And he says, more than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We cover up what is inside us with food and other good things. But in fasting, these things surface. Can I just pause there very quickly? For those of us who've been fasting for the last month and for those of us who will be fasting for the week to come, expect things to come out on the inside. Expect things to be shown to you about your character, about your person, perhaps about frustration or you know, just a little bit short-tempered and a lack of patience. About a hunger for things of this world. Expect those things to be exposed in our hearts. And when they do, respond as he does here. You see, if pride controls us, it will be revealed almost immediately. David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. Anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear. If they are within us, they will surface during fasting. And it's so easy, I find myself in the same temptation, blaming the fasting for the things that's coming out of me. It's the fast's problem, mistake, cause that I am short-tempered or that I have lack of patience or that I'm angry or that I'm not listening properly or whatever it may be. And then I began to realize it's not the fast's fault. It's my fault. It's a little bit like my child. The one kid loves saying, somebody else made me, in her case specifically, often scream. And then we're like, how did they climb inside of your throat and your lungs and squeeze your lungs and make you scream? 
No, they did this. Okay, so they did something and you're, you chose to react by screaming. They didn't make you scream. You're trying to coach her, trying to help her own that the screaming is her. She can choose how she responds to the situations. I think in a similar way, fasting, as it highlights these things in our hearts, the challenge for us is to be willing to own it and to say the fasting didn't make me do it. What was in me made me do it. If they are within us, they will surface during fasting. At first, we will rationalize that our anger is due to our hunger. And then we know that we are angry because the spirit of anger is within us. We can rejoice in this knowledge because we know that healing is available through the power of Christ. Expect fasting to refine you, to highlight in you a little bit of the stuff that God is wanting to grow. Pay attention to it. When that stuff comes to the fore in our fasting, whatever it may be, don't ignore it. Don't just say it's the fast fault. It's going to be over when the fasting is gone because guess what? It's not going to be gone when the fasting is over. It's still going to be on the inside unless we deal with it ruthlessly by grace. Bring it before God and say, God, this thing that's exposed in my heart is not meant to be there, Lord God. Help me grow. Help me change. It's a little bit like the example we always use with kids, you know, the test, I mean, the toothpaste tube test. Tiro doesn't know the toothpaste tube test. Do you know what comes out of a toothpaste tube when you squeeze it? Or whatever you put inside it. If there's toothpaste inside it and you squeeze it, toothpaste is going to come out of it. Whatever is inside of you or inside of me, that's what comes out when we're squeezed. And so as we're squeezed in a sense in a time of fasting, let's pay attention to what is coming out from the inside. Fasting, tying in with all of the other things that fasting does, one of the beautiful things that fasting does is it brings us before the Holy One. And then something not so pleasant always happens. Because in the midst of His holiness, in His purity, in His light, our depravity is exposed. You see, when we come before God in purity in our fasting, when we come before Him, we realize that He is and we are not. He is pure and we are impure. He is perfect and we are imperfect. He is patient and we are impatient. He is gracious and we are not gracious. He is loving and we are unloving. Not completely ex- devoid of all of it, but in the light of where He is, we are very far removed. And so as we come before the Holy One with our own Holy One, with our unholiness, let's deal with it through repentance, through confession. God isn't bringing us to a place of guilt and shame where we're now lying on our faces, weeping because of our sin. I love the fact that the New Testament calls us to repentance and not to sackcloth and ashes. The Old Testament was all about sackcloth and ashes. I am so bad. I am so evil. I can never be right. The New Testament is I am so bad, I am so evil, but Jesus is so glorious. And so let me not lock myself up in sackcloth and ashes when I become aware of my sin, but let me turn to the cross and invite Jesus in. Jesus, I am so impatient, and somehow, God, you are so patient. Would your strength be made perfect in my weakness? Would you come and refine? Would you come and change? God, if there is a root of bitterness, for example, inside of me, a root of anger, a root of frustration, God, would you come and take that out because that's what you did on the cross. You made a way. You came identified. You came and you stepped in to show not only what could and should be done, but also to make a way for it to be done. And so, Lord, my longing for pornography or addiction or whatever it is that I've got, it is evil and it is unholy before you. And I'm not going to just lock myself in a room and isolate and feel really sorry for myself. I'm going to turn to you, Jesus, because, Jesus, you've got this. My career, which is falling apart, 
Jesus, you've got this. My inability to learn. Jesus, you've got this. I keep bumping my head in the same way. My mouth keeps shooting itself off. Jesus, you've got this. God, it is wrong and it is sinful before you. I acknowledge my sin. But I'm not going to beat myself up because of my sin because you were beaten up because of my sin. And so, God, I bring that before you. And so confession and repentance. Repentance often is a super bad word for us as Christians. We think it's this heavy thing. The word repentance just means turning around. If I'm driving to Mozambique for a beautiful holiday on the beach and I see a street sign that says Cape Town, a thousand kilometers, and I'm heading towards Bloemfontein and I realize I'm on the wrong road, I don't know about you, but I'm going to stop as soon as possible and turn around and get on the right road. As believers, we should be the same. If we're on a road and we realize this is not the road that God is wanting us to be on, repentance is simply pulling to the side of the road, finding a safe place to turn around, turning around and getting back on the right road. I see that as a gift. I don't see that as punishment. It's a gift that God has given us that we get to repent. We don't have to get to Cape Town and get stuck in a Cape Town winter the whole time when we can't be lying on a Mozambique blue beach or white beach with blue water. He's given us the gift of repentance. Turn around as soon as we can. It's not a heavy thing. It is a beautiful thing to repent and to turn. The Bible says we should repent so that times of refreshing may come from the Holy Spirit. Embrace repentance as a gift And that gift will lead us to holiness. Not quite perfect holiness yet, but we will grow in holiness. And so part of the beauty of fasting is it exposes what is on the inside. It leads us to holy ground. And then once we've been on holy ground, we can confidently step out to the battleground. You see, we should never go to the battleground if we haven't first been on holy ground. So let's go back to Jesus in the wilderness. What was this bread test all about? I mentioned it very briefly earlier. The bread test was all about do the manna thing again. Except do the manna thing in your own strength. Do the manna thing because you have a need. In a sense, it's kind of reminding us that the point of the manna wasn't to expect miracles in a time of need, in a time of distress. It was simply to know God's got this. See, God didn't give the Israelites manna so that they can know whenever I'm in a time of distress, God's going to do a miracle. No, it was to know whenever I'm in a time of distress, I can look to God. He's got this. And so Jesus responds with, it's not about the bread. It's about the God of the bread. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, he says to Satan. So Satan loves doing this. He loves twisting God's word just a little bit. And he says, God gave the people manna in the past. Surely he can give you manna. He can just turn this whole thing to a loaf of bread. And I get that temptation. I'm hungry right now. And Jesus was like, it's not about the bread. It's not about the miracle. It's not about expecting every time I'm in distress to click my fingers and God is going to come and do something miraculous. That's not the God that I choose to serve. I serve a God who has got this. I don't know how. I don't know in which way. I know some way He has got this. And I would rather let Him come and make it right than step into my flesh to try and make it right. Yaku spoke about Abraham recently. Didn't Abram do exactly this? He forgot that God's got this. Abram thought he's going to make another plan. And there was a man called Ishmael born. God blessed him. God breathed on him. But he was never God's plan. I wonder how often in our lives we create little Ishmaels because the enemy comes and says, if you, then do something in the flesh. You make it right. You fix it. Without us stepping back and reminding ourselves, God has got this. And so let's not look for miracles and trust in miracles. Look for God. He's got this. And the beautiful thing about that is as Jesus looked for God, what was Jesus' ministry marked by more than anything else? Miracles. You see, it wasn't that God was against the miracles, but it was the miracles weren't the point. God was the point. 
It wasn't the bread that God created which was meant to sustain us. It was the God who creates it who is meant to sustain us. We can remind ourselves of beautiful passages. You know, it's not by might. It's not by power. Some other translations say it's not by force. It's not by strength. I don't know what situation you're going through in your life right now, but I do believe God wants to say this to some of us this morning. It's not by force. It's not by strength. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by His Spirit. So often we want to step into the natural. We want to make it right. We want to get the bolt cutter. I was sharing with the guys this morning. From time to time, God leads us to get the bolt cutter. This parking bay this morning, we've been speaking to the guys for ages. Eventually this week, they say, yes, we can have it. Except this morning, they couldn't find the key for the parking area. So I was like, can we just get a bolt cutter? Sometimes we do need to get a bolt cutter. But we can't get the bolt cutter before the owners of the lock have said, it's fine, we can get the bolt cutter. You're allowed on the premises. We're all okay with this. This is a solution to the problem. Sometimes we want to get the bolt cutter when the people on the other side are still saying, no, you're not allowed here. You can't park here. You see, you have to wait for the right time, for the right way. And then maybe God will use the bolt cutter and sometimes uses the key. Sometimes we do need the bolt cutter. Sometimes we do need to press in when the promise is there, when it's been answered, when we know that is the leading of the Lord. The challenge we take is sometimes we are presumptive. We don't remind ourselves enough. This battle is the Lord's. This battle is the Lord's. I so love that just in our, our weekly elders prayer meeting, as we come together to pray, just keep reminding ourselves, this battle is the Lord's. This church is the Lord's. These people are the Lord's. God will lead us. And God, we want your direction. God, we don't want to step ahead of what you are doing, God. God, there are so many dreams and hopes in our hearts but God, what's most important is the dream and the hope, God, in your heart. So we need to quiet ourselves. We need to humble ourselves. We need to seek your face, Lord, for your leading, for your direction, so that we don't step off in the flesh. Jesus got that right. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I wish we had so much time to speak about just this theology right here. And then the devil says to Jesus, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. The devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I think sometimes in this world, we miss that truth. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. And this is where the little asterisk I mentioned earlier comes in and it freaks my mind out a little bit. Jesus was tempted by this. Isn't that crazy? Jesus, even for just the slightest fleeting moment, considered bowing down to worship, Jesus, worship Satan. He considered, he understood that it was within his hands. He didn't say, no man, Satan, talking rubbish is not even yours anyway. There's no temptation in that. But there is a temptation in that because Jesus understands it is his. I believe at this stage, Towards the end of Jesus' 40-day fast, he knew what awaited him. He knew about the cross. I don't know at which stage in his life this was, he came to an awareness in his humanity, but I think at this stage, he knew the cross awaited him. He knew there was pain, there was suffering, but he knew there was purpose. And so Satan comes and offers him a shortcut. Satan says, Jesus, you came to redeem the glory of all the people, all the nations, you came, Jesus, to buy that back for your father. I will give it to you without any of the pain, without the suffering, without the humiliation. I will give it to you. And for a moment, Jesus is tempted by that. His answer is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. He says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. You see, his very life's purpose, in a sense, was offered to him. And I wonder you and I, as we are sitting here, what is it that God is calling us to? And we are aware of the pain, but we're looking for a shortcut. What is it that God is holding before us? And we know it's going to cost me something. And we are considering the easy way. And here Jesus is a beautiful example for us. 
He says no to the easy way. He says, it's going to glorify my Father. I will rather go through the pain and the suffering of the cross. I would rather be whipped, crown of thorns stuck in my head, bleed and go through all of that physical punishment, take the sin of the world upon my shoulders. It's going to cost me something. But that is my purpose. You see, Jesus comes to a point where he's offered an easy way out, but he knows God's got this. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be hurt lying before me, but God's got this. And he holds on to that. So before we look at the last one, I want to just nudge you around this. What is the purpose that is stirring in your heart? The purpose that God is calling you to count the cost over. Because he's got this. Whatever the cost, God has got this. Whether it's a financial cost, a reputational cost, perhaps the cost of your childhood dreams that you are having to give up because of what God is calling you to, God has got this. Don't take the easy way out. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and to guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, this time also from Deuteronomy chapter 6, but verse 13, and he says, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Here we see, kind of when I read this, I see Jesus right here as an opportunity to get one over the devil, right at the start of his ministry. Just that emotional need to show him, I am God's and God will protect me. You know, just get that elbow in just as my ministry starts. Just a little bit push the devil down. Just remind him where he's from. There's a little bit of a temptation here just to say, oh, let me jump off. Let me just show him God's got this. Let me just show him that I am who I say I am. Let me just step into this emotional void a little bit and just prove to the devil that he isn't as grand as he thinks he is, that I am actually God's anointed. Let's just quickly settle this thing. Just nudge him just as we start. Just trip him up. Just say, devil, you're a loser before anything else. And yet Jesus chooses to refrain himself and say, I'm not going to step into that. I'm not going to engage in the foolishness that the enemy is calling him to. I have a purpose. I have a plan. I'm going to remain focused on that. I'm not going to test God to try and prove a point to you, devil. I'm not going to step out and say, watch, my God is bigger and stronger or whatever. I don't have anything that I need to prove to you. I'm secure in my identity. I don't want to show you wrong. I don't need to get one over you right at the start because this journey, these next three years, as I'm going to be spending time on this earth, undoing all of the evil that the devil has been doing, God has got this. And so I'm not going to step into the flesh. God has got this. And when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity. The devil is going to continue to look for opportunities to trip us up for when we are weak, when we are exposed in every one of those, let us remind ourselves, God has got this. His way is higher than our way. It's different to our way. It is so easy for me to want to do it my way. But my way, as I've learned in my life, normally doesn't work. It might look really good at the start, but His way is better. His, my way looks brilliant until... The first pawpaw hits the fan, and then my way just falls apart completely. And God is sitting there looking at me with grace and saying, I told you there was a better way. My way. Trust me. I've got this. So this morning, I'd love to pray with us. Pray with that, perhaps one or two individuals, maybe more. You're here this morning, and there's something in your life, and you're struggling. Even just right at the start, we were singing, here in your presence, you know, I am undone. Here in your presence, God, I just want to bow before God. I'm struggling to bow before you and to say, you've got this, God, because I don't know that you've got this. I can't see that you've got this. I can't understand how you can 
have this God, whatever it may be that I, in that sense you're struggling with, if that's you this morning, we would love to pray with you. If you need someone just to pray with you over something in your life, if you just need to say again, God, you have got this. I'm taking my hands off. I'm not going to try and turn this bread into stone or stone into bread. I'm not going to try and step into the natural. I'm not going to create more Ishmaels. God, you have got this, Lord. So give me grace to do this your way. Can we stand this morning as we close in prayer? And as we're standing up, perhaps if that's you this morning, I just want to ask, can we all just close our eyes, just out of respect for what God is doing to the people around us? This morning, if that's you, if you need to say, God's got this in some area of your life. While our heads are all bowed and our eyes are closed, can I ask you just to put up your hand and say, Philip, that's me. Please pray with me. Philip, I need to surrender. I know my head knows God's got this, but my heart, my, it's hard. I, I don't know how to let go. I need to step into grace. I need to turn to the cross. I need to find a way to Allow God to get this. I'm going to ask those of you who raised their hands just to be super bold. We're going to all pray together. Don't you just want to step to the front? I would love for someone just to be able to pray with you. It's the first step of saying, God's got this. God, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to humble myself. Fasting does that. In this sense, stepping out in this way does as well. It's an acknowledgement, God, I don't got this. But God, you've got this. Is there anybody else who still wanted to join in? Perhaps you're here this morning and you know your relationship with Jesus isn't what it should be. You're so aware of your sin and your shame and your guilt and you just need to surrender that even to Jesus. Is there anybody else? We'll wait for you if there's anybody else. So Father, I thank you God for Every single one here this morning. Can we have some facilitators just come and pray with these people in front? God, I thank you for every one of us here this morning, God. Thank you specifically, God, for those who stepped out, Lord Jesus. God, I thank you that they're just coming and inviting you in, Lord Jesus. Lord, they're inviting you to come and take over. God, you know the challenge. You know exactly what it is they're facing, Lord. You know the area. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you breathe life over it, God? Would you show them your response and your truth, God? Would you allow them to step in the spirit and and not in the flesh, Lord Jesus? God, may they discover your grace, the power of the cross of Christ, the truth of the gospel, God, in this very area of their lives. And God, I pray the same for all of us this morning. God, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, Would you breathe life over us, Lord? Would you leave us in truth and in righteousness, in justice, for your name's sake? Amen. We're going to spend some time praying to those in front. If you need some prayer, perhaps write something totally different, you're more than welcome to step forward. We'd love to pray with you. The band is going to continue to minister. If you just want to spend time in worship, you can do that. There's coffee and tea outside. Have some coffee and tea. We'd Love to get to know you guys a little bit better. And then do remember, if you're parked at the hospital, you need to come back into the church premises, and then you can either go straight or turn right to get out, depending on which exit you would like to use. God bless. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.